Hi folks, welcome to class 4 uh, of philanthropy and pluralism and uh, in this class we look at primarily reviewing the book which is uh, subscribed for the class today which is Civil Society, Philanthropy and Fate of the Commons and uh, look at some of the key arguments he makes um, and really get a critical overview of the book and really understand uh, what's going on here. So uh, the book as you can see is Civil Society, Philanthropy, and Fate of the Commons, uh, which is a fairly recent book, if you think about it, but is already considered a classic uh, in its own right, and is uh, is a required reading for most classes on uh, civil society and philanthropy. And uh, the basic thesis of this book is uh, that he explores the concept of civil society and suggests that civil society is critical uh, for a healthy democracy. So without a uh, strong civil society, it's not possible to have uh, a strong democracy, is what he's saying. And uh, there is a reason to believe in that. And I think uh, in, in a certain context that we are studying civil society and concepts of democracy, it makes sense to pay close attention to what he's saying. And it's a fairly well-written book. It's an easy read, as I pointed out in class, and uh, covers a lot of ground in terms of the amount of time and the the kind of concepts that he goes through. So there are a few key concepts here in this book that I want to outline. Uh, the first, of course, is civil society. Uh, and uh, he defines that as any arena that is outside of family, government, or market where people voluntarily associate to advance common interests based on civility. And uh, this uh, you know, is, is a fairly uh, common definition, uh, but I also like the one given by a British scholar called Chandran Kokathas. He just says, uh, civil society is society, you know, common people coming together and interacting, doing business, you know, uh, having fun, you know, conversing, uh, doing, carrying on the normal business of life. So that's, that's basically civil society. Um, there are a million definitions of civil society, as you may imagine, but these, this definition works for me and the one by Kukathas is also a pretty good one. So a common good is another important idea which is important to keep in mind while you're reading this book. So common good is any uh, any public good, anything for instance like, we, I think we talked about this in class uh, the other day. Uh, for instance, clean air uh, you know, is a common good. Water, uh, you know, in the rivers. Uh, or a grazing pasture, you know, is a common good. Uh, so things uh, that are common to all of us and which require protection or uh, nurturing by all of us uh, fall into this category. Uh, he mentions a few important theorists that have written quite a lot about these issues. Michael Walzer, Helmut Anheyer, Charles Taylor, Hamid Aizioni. So the last two are uh, philosophers. Uh, so is Michael Walzer, actually, uh, and they have written extensively on issues of what is common good, how do we define common good, uh, how do we come to agreement about common good, and whatnot. So, uh, an important concept, regardless of where you stand on these issues. Uh, another important concept is democracy. Democracy, we've been talking about this from class one, so I'll skip that and, um, you know, with the understanding that you have a fairly decent understanding of what is democracy. Rights versus ethics, I think that's another important uh, concept that he delves into quite a bit, talking about how rights uh, discourse versus the discourse of ethics have evolved uh, over the centuries to bring us to where we are. Uh, let's switch gears and uh, focus on the core of what he argues here in terms of um, how he says that in the 17th century, Dutch Republic is really the one that is responsible for the kind of civil society that we have today in the West. Now, uh, this came about again, not not just all of a sudden in the 17th century, but over a gradual period of time, uh, beginning with the separation of religion and state. So as most of you know, uh, that there was really, state was the religion, religion was the state in the Western world. And in some parts of the world, it is still today, right? So one of the things that enlightenment brought us, one of the benefits of the enlightenment was really separating these two 
and saying uh, the religion should not have as much of a say in state and uh, any person who lives in a particular place should have the equal rights as anyone else. So uh, this he argues came about by really the contribution of Aristotle, the redisco rediscovery of Aristotle in 13th century that led to a, a more common conception of a political and natural community and moving away from a purely theological worldview. Um, an example uh, that he offers uh, in terms of how this led to the development of the common good uh, or community is uh, the fable of the bees, which you know was offered by Bernard Mandel. He says, uh, by each of us doing our own individual good, we all collectively uh, you know contribute to the common good, which is how the bees work, right? And uh, another important character in this whole, actually the three important characters that he mentions uh, and goes into quite a bit of depth uh, is Benedict Spinoza, the Jewish philosopher uh, who lived in the Netherlands and that general area and his fight for individual rights and how he was persecuted by the state. And then uh, finally his ideas later on caught on and uh, became very important for the evolution of religious freedom and individual rights and things like that. Hugo Grotius, uh, whose contribution to um, you know universalization of law and in terms of norms of rights, uh, which he which he calls uh, significant uh, in our understanding of how civil society has shaped them, and finally uh, Adam Smith, who was uh, again uh, wrote quite a lot on philosophy and uh, you know political economy of the world, and his argument about the invisible hand and how it would. Uh, solve the, the invisible hand in the market would solve many of the problems that we face uh, we face as a collective now uh, just focusing on this a little bit he, he says that 17th century Dutch society is really the harbinger of civil society and he offers seven postulates or constitutive elements of civil society that created the framework for um, how people participate and freely give uh, in a in a societal framework, and uh, these are uh, these elements really strengthen the commons, and uh, uh, he suggests that th this is the only real way how you can uh, strengthen a civil society. So, what are these seven strands that make up civil society? So here uh, he lists he lists them. He says philanthropy, the common good, rule of law, non-profit and voluntary institutions. Uh, individual rights, freedom of expression, and tolerance. So he goes into depth uh, of each of these, and uh, I trust that you will read it and uh, try to make sense of what he's saying by each of these. But uh, as the words suggest, uh, these are constitutive of what we what we think of a civil society. So in the absence of one or two of these, it would be hard to say, according to him, that a really free civil society exists. So when analyzing any book, uh, it's always good to look at the core thesis, the arguments, um, and also ask a book, what proof does he offer? Like what does he, uh, what does he show for making the claims that he makes? So here the proof uh, that he offers is historical data. He does offer a good rich historical repertoire, quoting other scholars, looking at other historical documents, uh, and also uh, in terms of linking those arguments with social changes, so historical and sociological data in terms of how did people think of law, how did people think of uh, their obligations to each other, uh, their obligations to society, uh, and how, how did that come about uh, over the centuries and where we are today. So I think he does a fairly, fairly good job with that as well. Uh, another question you can ask when you analyze any book is what are the strengths of the book? Like uh, just as you analyze an article, so what, what, what is the strength of this book? So he does offer a good historical context for the discourse of civil society. He does give a good overview of how civil society has evolved in the Western world. And he offers a key uh, few arguments in terms of linking civil society and democracy. So obviously he does a fairly good job. And I think uh, the book is worth reading for that. Uh, what are the weaknesses uh, that one might encounter? Uh, one of, I found two weaknesses. Uh, that are quite glaring. Uh, I think most of his arguments that he makes are limited only to Western societies because if you take this and try to make sense of Asia, of Middle East, of China, uh, which is also Asia, uh, look at other contexts and other countries which are not Western, um, you know, I think 
and these ideas might not really translate well in practice uh, and also secondly how does uh, how do we make sense of the common good uh, what is the common good and how do people reconcile their ideas of what is common good for instance do people agree on climate change is a real problem um, today in today's america or has it a guess and say not everyone does right so things like that i think are problematic and how do we reconcile those notions of common good is something he's not explained very clearly so overall i think this is a very good book and uh, i hope you read it carefully and answer the discussion that's offered uh, on online and uh, i will be happy to answer any questions by email or look forward to meeting you all next uh, next week thank you